Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from more grisly tales for gruesome kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Scream. Tonight's story is called Crocodile Tears. The Howling household was damper than your average home. Herbie Howling was a man who loved his family. In fact, he loved his family so much that every time his wife or daughter did something, even if it was only reading a newspaper or making a cup of tea or walking through a door, he was overcome with such gut-wrenching pride that he gushed tears like a big sobbing baby. Sissy Howling, his wife, shed tears of quite a different sort. She was a nervous wreck and jumped neurotically from one imaginary crisis to another. She wept tears of terror morning, noon and night. Spiders didn't help, but gas bills, front doorbells, carpet stains, fast-moving pets, can openers, sheets that wouldn't crease straight, and her tearful daughter's handkerchief pile all reduced her to tears in seconds. Gwendolyn was that tearful daughter. She had learnt everything she knew from her soft, oversensitive parents. She was a nasty, manipulative child who used tears as a weapon to get whatever it was she wanted. Oh, what's the matter with my weepy wen? wept her father. Seeing his daughter cry always made him cry too. I've got too much homework to do, blubbered Gwendolyn. I think it might be going to give me a headache. Eek, cried her father, then no. His face paled as his huge frame juddered. Not a headache. Please, when tell me it's not a headache. But, Daddy, trembled the wet-eyed Wen. It is a headache. A headache? This time the whale was Sissy's. What do we think has caused it? She whimpered. Oh, how shall I survive if my only daughter is taken ill? Do we think it's something serious? Do you think there's a possibility you might... The D word stuck in her quavering throat. She couldn't say it out loud. I want you to know, Gwendolyn sobbed, that you have been... The sweetest, dearest parents a girl could ever have hoped for. Oh, it is serious, bawled Sissy. I can tell. Well, it might be, snivelled Gwendolyn, as her father wept copiously into the velveteen curtains and wrung them out on the patio. Unless, unless you let me bunk off my homework. She hesitated to wipe a big rolling tear from her cheek. For that is the only way I can avoid the head pain. Then, as Gwendolyn broke down again, her howling parents fell upon her shoulder and beseeched her, in the name of all that was sacred to their family, to promise them that she would not, under any circumstances, touch her wretched homework that night. Gwendolyn's bottom lip wobbled like a springboard, and even though her eyes were misty with tears, she forced a brave smile, sniffed courageously, and nodded her assent. For the sake of her parents' peace of mind, she would selflessly abandon her homework. You do see how it worked, don't you? D Daddy, can I have a new dress? No tears equals no dress. Daddy, can I have a new dress? Well, if it means that much to you, Gwenny Wenny, of course you can, my pretty little angel. Tears made all the difference, and Gwendolyn had every tear known to man, woman and child in her armoury. She could do temper tantrum. I won't get back in the car. I won't. It makes me feel sick. I want to ride in the front next to Daddy so that people think I'm a woman. But your mother prefers it in the front. Ooh, boo-hoo! My cheeks are going to burst if you don't let me. 
I'll go in the back, howled her mother in distress, while Herbie banged his tortured head on the bonnet and wet buckets down the metallic paintwork for being such a wicked father and nearly saying no to his daughter. She could do poor pathetic me. Oh, nobody loves me, she sobbed outside the shoe shop. I'm so miserable. It's only a teeny tiny pair of shoes. If I had my own money, I wouldn't ask you to pay for them, but I am only a little baby child, Daddy. And you are my father. Herbie Howling always cried when Gwendolyn called him father. It made him feel protective, like a big, strong, burglar-bashing man. So it is your job. And when I'm bigger, I shall buy you a wheelchair and carpet slippers. But don't let that influence your decision now. She got the shoes after a mega-hugging, kissing and weeping session on the pavement. She could do pain. Ooh. Ah. Ah, yowza. Yowza. Then a gasp, a frozen gesture, a melodramatic hand to the mouth, a faint. I'll be all right. Another gasp. No, nobody must look. It's too gruesome. I think I might have cut my finger clean off. Ooh, ooh, ow, ow. Might I trouble you for a plaster and a needle and thread? I won't be a nuisance. I'll sit quietly in the corner and stitch it back on. I'll be fine. Another pause while excruciating pain squeezed glassy tears from her tightly closed eyes. Might I have an aspirin to take away the pain? Uh, or a Coca-Cola or something? A pizza or an ice cream would definitely work. Or a hot dog? She got the hot dog with extra chilli sauce, and by the time she gobbled it all up, causing joyful tears to spring from the eyes of her parents, who loved to watch her eat, her bad finger had miraculously cured itself. There wasn't even a scratch on it. And she could do volume. Oh boy, could she do volume. She could pitch over a fire engine. She could scream down a Formula One racing car. She could outwail a flood warning. Gwendolyn Howling was a professional crybaby who used her dubious talents to get what she wanted. They weren't real tears. They were made on the spot, squeezed out of bone-dry tear ducts, each one a work of art in its own right. They were crocodile tears. And you don't need me to tell you how ruthless a crocodile can be. One day, just before Christmas, Gwendolyn and her parents were fighting over the television. Sissy and Herbie Howling wanted to watch the news. There was talk of nuclear war between Britain and Plutovia, so nothing too important. But Gwendolyn wanted to watch a new boy band, Hunks and Chunks, strut their stuff live on the funk party. Oh, but Daddy, please, she wailed, burying her head in an embroidered cushion and sneakily rubbing her eyes against the coarse material. When she looked up, they were bright red. My whole life depends on seeing this band. Don't you understand? She bowed her head as if trying to control her judders. If I don't see them, I shall be ostracized at school. I shall become a loner, friendless and unloved, drifting towards a life of desolation with no GCSEs, neck tattoos, and a pit bull terrier who eats old ladies' sausages. She burst into a howl at the thought of such a squalid existence. Tears popped out of her eyes and squirted down her face, where they were allowed to drip off the end of her chin and splash to the floor for maximum effect. Her father hovered over the remote control. He glanced at his wife, whose worried lips were twitching. How could they be so cruel to their own flesh and blood? Oh, turn it over, he blurted. The words exploded out of his mouth like water bursting through a damn wall. I'm such a fiend. Forget the news, howled her mother. It's only a nuclear world war. There'll be another. Oh, I'm so selfish. Forgive me, Gwenny. Watch your lovely boys. I could never be happy again knowing that I had caused such misery in your life. 
when redoubled her tears, switching from poor pathetic me to I must be the luckiest girl in the world to have you two saints for parents. She flung her arms around her father's neck, squeezed her mother's hand, and the three of them wept waterfalls in a great big triangle of love. But by the time they had finished and switched over to the funk party, Hunks and Chunks had finished their song. Oh, I'm gutted, choked her father. Me too, wailed her mum, while Wen howled out of the room in a state of emotional hysteria. If she sobbed much more, her heart would surely break. At least that was the impression she gave. She ran upstairs to the bathroom and turned off the tears like a tap. She didn't care a fig about hunks and chunks. All she cared about was getting her own way, and she'd done that. But while she was wiping the crocodile tears from her cheeks and peering at her puffy face in the mirror, she saw something move in the corner of her eye. Something with webbed feet and a yellow bill. It looked like a duck. A teeny, tiny duck, no bigger than a pea. And as she peered more closely, it dribbled out of her eye, trapped inside a glistening tear. She wiped the tear onto a finger and burst the bubble with a nail. The diminutive duck opened its tiny bill and spoke in a soft, watery voice. I am a tear duck, it hissed, born of titch witchery. I bring you a warning from Sakusaki, the old croc. Gwendolyn was so surprised to hear this tiny creature talk that her mouth fell open. You would do well to be scared. He is the father of all crocodiles, a monstrous magical beast torn from a time when sorcery reigned, a time when crocodile tears were as precious as diamonds because only crocodiles cried them. But the day that children stole the tears for their own selfish ends was the day the tears became worthless. If you continue to spill them, Sakusaki will have no choice but to take back what are rightfully his. Take back my tears? sneered Gwendolyn. What on earth do you mean? The tear duck opened its bill as if to reply, but instead of words a glass tear plopped out into Gwendolyn's palm. It was the size of a pinhead and swirled inside with white buffeting clouds. Then suddenly the clouds parted and the tear blinked. There was an eye inside. It was the green eye of a crocodile and reflected in the pupil was Gwendolyn's face. Her eyes were stuck wide, her mouth was open. She was screaming with fear. Take great care, prophesied the tear duck, reading the glass tear like a crystal ball. Sakusaki knows where you are. No more faking, or it will all end in tears, scoffed Gwendolyn in a bored know-it-all voice. She had heard grown-ups spin this lie so often that it had ceased to have any meaning. I'm not three years old, you know, she sneered. I don't believe you. And she didn't. She believed that Sakusaki was a myth, that crocodile tears were a good thing because they got her what she wanted, and that a talking duck the size of a pea was just a weird daydream. But when her parents told her to put her coat on because they were taking her to see a pantomime and the pantomime was Peter Pan with Captain Hook and the crocodile, Gwendolyn had a rethink. The crocodile thing was probably just a coincidence, but why take the risk? After all, she still had plenty of other ammunition to get what she wanted. Kicking, sulking, screaming, stomping. She'd just have to cut out the crocodile tears for the time being. So when her parents wanted to take a bus to the theatre and Gwendolyn wanted to ride in a white limousine, she did not cry. She smashed a vase on the telly and burst a cushion instead. 
when they arrived at the theatre and she wanted the most expensive seats in the house, she trod on the toe of the Lady Mayor, threw herself at the wall and beat her little fists black and blue until her father coughed up the cash. And still no tears. And there were no tears when she screamed for sweets either. Oh, yum, bum, tickle my tum, chocolate! I want a big box of honeycomb centres, some dusty white truffles and a fudge forest! Well, I don't think so, said her mother sensibly. You'll ruin your dinner. The bottom lip trembled, the cheeks wobbled, the voice started to waver. But no tears. But I love chocolate, when he whined, drawing stares of disgust gust and disbelief from fellow theatre-goers, but she hadn't finished yet. Help! she shrieked. Help! My parents beat me! Her mother blushed with embarrassment, while her sweaty father rushed over from the kiosk with all the chocolates he could carry. About time, she said gracelessly. By the way, I'm really looking forward to a raspberry ripple in the interval, and I want a programme now, and some toys. Fifty pounds and much hair-tugging, stare-chewing and mirror-kicking later. And Gwendolyn had a programme, a pair of binoculars, a fluorescent necklace, a big foam finger to point at the baddies, and a coat on a seat to raise her up for a perfect view. And still, not a tear shed. Her poor father, however, was completely cleaned out. He only had two pounds left, and he was saving that for the raspberry ripple. So at the interval, when the person in front of her in the queue bought the last raspberry ripple in the theatre, Herbie and Sissy knew that a rumpus was brewing. Gwenny pulled the woman's hair and called her a greedy pig. That was mine, she yelled. But as she did so, she felt a well-oiled welling rise in the back of her throat. She recognised the sign. It was a tear, escaping from the depths of her tortured soul. Get me a raspberry ripple, she hollered at a spineless, wet-faced father, and make it snappy. Speed was of the essence if tears were to be avoided. Run, run, run! He was sprinting down the aisles, trying to buy a raspberry ripple from another member of the audience. Suddenly, he stopped and leapt in the air. Bingo! he shouted, holding the ice cream aloft. Wen smiled, the tears subsided, and a ripple of relief spread across the audience. Now at last this horrible girl would cease her spoiled antics, and they could return to watching the pantomime. Wait! There was still a problem. Her father had bought a raspberry cone, and Gwendolyn wanted a tub. But I can't buy you one now, he whimpered pulling out his empty pockets. I've no money left. With one flex of her epiglottis, his diabolic daughter let out a supersonic scream that woke the sleeping cherubs on the ceiling and rattled the safety curtain. I want a raspberry tub, she howled, flopping to the floor and kicking her legs like a two-year-old. Then she tossed in a spoiled, Ah! at the top of her voice just in case there was anybody in the theatre who wasn't paying attention. Her mother and father squirmed. The audience looked the other way. Actors poked their heads around the curtain to see what was going on. But no raspberry tub appeared. This was one battle she was not going to win. Unless... Gwendolyn stopped screaming and thought for a second, unless she changed tactics and gained the audience's sympathy. If she acted weak and feeble, some kind-hearted person was bound to give her their tub. But sympathy required tears. There was nothing else for it. Gwendolyn checked the auditorium for crocodiles. The one on stage didn't count. It was only a bloke in a costume. And went for the big blub down. The crocodile tears arrived at a rush. They were unstoppable. They pumped out of her eyes, cascaded down her cheeks and dripped into a lapping lake at her feet. The audience softened. No adult can be cross with a crying child. Raspberry tubs were handed along the aisles until she had more than she could carry. Her tears were a triumph. 
and Weepy Wen was as pleased as Punch. She had won. Or had she? Suddenly, she doubled over and clutched her eyes. It felt like they'd just been stabbed with a pin. What's happening? squealed her mother. I don't know, screamed Wen. There's something in my eye. Take it out. Take it out. Wenny, wailed her father, treading on toes as he rushed to pick her up. Show me what's... But he pulled up short when he saw her eyes. What's wrong? he gasped. Your eyes have turned green. And as he watched, the largest tear that Gwendolyn had ever shed oozed out of her right eye and plinked into her hands. She froze. She knew what she was going to find. The tear duck had warned her. Trapped inside the shimmering dome was Sakusaki, the old croc himself. But far from being the monstrous magical beast that the tear duck had described, Sakusaki was no bigger than a jelly bean. Gwendolyn roared with laughter. To think that I was scared of you, she crowed. I could squash you with my thumb. But when she tried to, she cut her thumb badly. The crocodile's skin was as sharp as coral and the blood from the cut dripped over the tear. In the twinkle of a reptile's eye, the magic crocodile grew until it was three times Gwendolyn's size. Then, with one snap of its powerful jaws, it woofled her up like a tub of ice cream. The audience gasped with horror. Some even ran for the exits. But when the crocodile cried pretend tears and wailed in a high-pitched impersonation of Gwendolyn, Oh, look what I've done! I've gobbled her up by mistake! I'm such a silly billy! I hope I haven't spoiled the pantomime! The audience stopped and laughed and thought it was part of the show. And when the crocodile took a bow and vanished in a puff of smoke, they thought it was magic and applauded. Nobody seemed to notice that Gwendolyn hadn't come back. Except for her parents. They were inconsolable and wept for ten years without stopping. So you see, it did all end in tears. After all, no! <laughs>